Let me just uh, briefly now introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Paul McIntyre, who's uh, currently the chair of the Material Science and Engineering Department. Uh, Paul's been working with Chris Chidsey from Chemistry on a uh, collaborative GSEP project on the protection of uh, photoanodes, actually pioneered a, uh, a method to protect silicon as a photoanode. So I, I think we'll hear about that and some other work from his group today. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today, and I want to thank the two uh, uh, speakers, Matt and Hao Tian, and, uh, for uh, introducing some of the key issues, and they'll actually save me some work here. Uh, rather than going up on the podium, I'm going to wander back and forth um, in, in front of it, uh, and uh, uh, we'll, just, we'll just get going. I'd, I'd like to begin by um, uh, acknowledging the uh, uh, the other people involved, and really the, the people mainly involved in this work, uh, the, uh, the students and, and postdoc who, whose research I'll be discussing here today, Andrew Shoreman, Olivia Hendricks, and Kyle Kemp, and also, of course, uh, my co-PI, Chris Chidsey, who's really been instrumental in, in all of this, and uh, support from GSEP at leverage of, of various kinds. So um, the, uh, we've been sort of introduced to this uh, problem of, of how to think about renewable fuel or chemical synthesis and why we're interested in such a thing. Uh, GSEP started off with uh, part of its mission to address uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and we can ask uh, how uh, technology could play a role in, in reducing those. Um, and uh, we can uh, uh, think both in terms of, of uh, embracing energy efficiency and also uh, a move toward more renewable sources of, of energy uh, away from fossil fuels uh, and also uh, removing uh, greenhouse gases uh, during uh, the combustion and, and processing of, of, of such fuels, uh, capturing that and, and, uh, and storing it. And of course the economics of, of this become uh, uh, much more interesting if we can turn it into a, a useful uh, product. And uh, renewables suffer from intermittency. So in both cases, uh, finding ways to store uh, renewable energy so that we can use it uh, later is, uh, is desirable, and fuels are, are one approach for that. So we've been looking at uh, um, solar fuel synthesis, uh, synthesis of, of fuels, in, in, in our case hydrogen, uh, through um, absorption of light. And uh, uh, why fuels from sunlight? This is a, um, a, a figure that I got uh, just last week from our colloquium speaker, Joel Ager from LBNL, uh, and I just I think it's a great figure. He calls it his... Uh, uh, if you look at this, t uh, less filling tastes great slide. I don't think that's right, but it's uh, uh, less volume weighs less. Uh, so, f so fuels are great in terms of storing energy in a small volume or small mass. Hydrogen is great in terms of its specific energy density. Uh, hydrocarbons are great in terms of volumetric density. Uh, lithium ion batteries are down here uh, because you have to cart around the electrolyte and all the solid stuff um, uh, with you. So uh, and from, from the perspective of this density, uh, uh, these density factors, fuel is great. Uh, if you uh, uh, want to two meters by 10 meters for, 10, uh, for two weeks uh, to, to, uh, to be able to do that. So it's an amazing uh, thing how efficiently we can store energy with fuels. So we've been focusing on, just going back here for a moment, we've been focusing, whoop, going, <laughs> try that one more time. Going back, uh, we, we've been focusing on hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is an interesting fuel in its own right. It's also uh, the case that in synthesizing hydrogen, we, we create uh, protons and electrons that can be used to uh, synthesize some of these other products as well. So it's an interesting uh, reaction from that point of view. The overall uh, electrochemical reaction for this, we've been looking at an integrated approach, so integrating the solar component and the catalyst together. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in this, uh, the, the earliest example of this, in fact, uh, uh, is uh, from the early 1970s, was worked by Fujishima and Honda on an early photoelectrochemical cell. And uh, the, the basic idea here is that we have, a, a, in this case, a large band gap absorber. Uh, uh, it uh, absorbs light and creates electrons and holes, uh, and uh, the, uh, this uh, large band gap n-type semiconductor is such that the electrons will be swept out of the absorber through an external uh, wire to the other side of the cell. So this is the uh, cathodic reaction, the uh, reduction of protons to make hydrogen, and uh, this will, in this case, occurred on a metal cathode. Uh, and on this side of the, uh, of the cell, we have the anodic reaction uh, we need holes to come to the surface because they're needed 
in uh, oxidizing water to make O2. Now this is the kinetically limiting um, uh, half reaction. And uh, uh, in this case, with the large uh, photovoltage that we have, the driving force is pr that's provided by this large band gap, this three electron volt band gap of, of TiO2, we don't actually need to have uh, an oxygen evolution catalyst on the surface. It will, it will generate um, oxygen and protons and electrons um, on its own. Uh, but in many other cases of semiconductors with smaller band gaps or smaller driving force, we need those catalysts to make this work. And a lot of our research is try to, trying to link up efficient catalysts with, with good light absorbers. Uh, so the other, the other aspect of TiO2 that's important to be aware of is it, it's, it's useful in this application because it's very stable. Uh, it's as oxidized as it's going to get. So we don't have to worry about um, oxidative corrosion of TiO2 as we would with many other semiconductors. Uh, so, uh, so from that perspective, it's, a, it's an interesting choice as well. Um, now when we look at the uh, uh, energetics of this though, we see that there are some serious limitations with materials like TiO2. So this is a, a, a plot of the uh, uh, solar irradiance at the Earth's surface as a function of wavelength. And we can see that TiO2 with its large band gap is basically just absorbing uh, photons that have uh, wavelengths less than 400 nanometers. So we're, we're in the ultraviolet here with TiO2. It's a very small fraction of the incident solar light that this can harvest. Uh, so that's going to inherently limit the efficiency of something like TiO2. Other metal oxides that are also quite stable under these conditions suffer from the same problem, but to a lesser degree. Uh, can't, you can't see so clearly here, but this is, a, this is a line for silicon. So silicon will absorb about 80% of the incident uh, uh, solar light. And uh, of course, silicon is a huge industry around silicon photovoltaics, so it's an interesting choice uh, from, from the perspective of this technology. There's two problems with it. It's not stable. Uh, in silicon, in, in silicon isn't stable under water oxidation conditions. Uh, and um, uh, because it's got a smaller band gap, the photovoltage is smaller, and therefore we need more than one photoelectrode. We can't just have, as we did with TiO2, a single photoanode. We actually need to make what's called a tandem cell. So uh, we've been focusing uh, initially on how to protect silicon and other high quality absorbers so that they'll be stable under these very uh, demanding uh, conditions. So uh, the approach that we've used uh, uh, takes advantage of a technique called atomic layer deposition, uh, which is widely used in the semiconductor industry. Uh, we start with a silicon wafer that has an oxide on it. This is the oxide that comes from the wafer vendor. Uh, it's a very thin oxide on the order of a nanometer or 1.5 nanometers in thickness. And uh, we, uh, we use a technique called atomic layer deposition to coat this substrate in a quasi layer by layer fashion. So uh, it's a cyclic process. We expose the surface to, a, in this case, a metal organic precursor. It absorbs in the surface in a saturating way. Uh, and then we introduce an oxidant. It reacts with the ligands on the, on the uh, saturated layer and leaves behind something like a monolayer of TiO2. Uh, and then we can just repeat that process many times to build up the thickness that we're interested in. One of the aspects of this technique that's so uh, special is that because of its surface saturating character, it's possible to make films that are very, very thin uh, without pinholes. So for this kind of application, that's really quite important. So we start off with an ALD TiO2 layer, and this is not the absorber of the light. Silicon is going to absorb the light. This is a very thin protection layer. That's what it's really functioning as. And then we add a known catalyst. So in this case, we add uh, iridium, which when it's uh, oxidizing water, converts to, its surface converts to iridium oxide, which is um, uh, one of the very best water oxidation catalysts. Uh, it's great because it has a very low overpotential. That means that we don't have to provide that much additional uh, driving force to split water on iridium oxide. It's stable across a whole range of pH, uh, and it has a large work function, which is an important factor when we're trying to extract holes, and is not the case for a lot of other uh, oxides that are more, much more earth abundant. So this is what the structure looks like when we're done. We have an iridium catalyst layer, thin ALD TiO2. This is about two nanometers deposited by, uh, uh, by this ALD technique, and then the SiO2 uh, interlayer, as we call it. So if we look at the performance of this kind of structure, we shine light. Uh, we have use an n-type silicon substrate, something like the n-type TiO2 that Fujishima and Honda used. Uh, and we've, we're plotting here uh, for various pH solutions. Uh, the thermodynamic potentials relative to a hydrogen reference electrode where uh, water splitting should happen if there were no kinetic losses or no barriers 
Uh, it just, so just based on thermodynamics where we would expect those things to happen is a function of these different pHs. This is concentrated base, pH 7 buffer, concentrated acid. So in the dark, when we have no light to drive this, we don't see any current, and that's because we don't have any, any holes in our n-type silicon. We need to photogenerate them. So when we turn on the light, this is what happens. We get a very dramatic turn on of these devices. It happens at all pHs. Uh, and uh, we can get to quite high current densities. And we notice that under illumination, the, the turn on uh, potential, if you will, for these things is shifted to the left of the thermodynamic potentials. And that would not normally happen unless we were harvesting some energy uh, from the light absorption process itself. So this, this negative shift here, or shift to lower potentials, is an indication of a part of the photovoltage that exists in the device. When we compare those curves to what happens when we do dark electrolysis on whole doped silicon, we can, we can infer a photovoltage of about 550 millivolts. And in recent, more recent work where we've learned how to do this uh, better, and we've learned a lot of the, uh, the tricks uh, to improving this, these materials and these interfaces, we can boost this number up above 600 millivolts now. Um, so uh, stability, of course, is the, is the reason why we're doing this. Uh, so what happens to the stability of silicon when we coat it with these very thin layers? So we've investigated layers generally in the thickness range between 2 and 12 nanometers. We've been able to see stability greater than 72 hours uh, in, for, for that whole range. Uh, I'm showing a couple of representative data sets here. This is 10 nanometer and 12 nanometer TiO2. In this case, the hose that we have in our cell broke, and we replaced it and carried on and kept going. Um, uh, 72 hours is, is just a practical limitation. We only have one simulated solar light source, and the students get unhappy with each other if one person uses it for more than three days at a time. So we're kind of limited there. But uh, there's no doubt that these things will survive much longer than that. We don't really fully understand the reliability physics of this yet, so that remains to be seen. Um, so th thinking about this, though, uh, in terms of actually a technology, uh, from a... From a um, uh, engineering uh, safety margin perspective, one might like to be able to deposit thicker TiO2 layers. Uh, we don't know the mechanism of failure, but presumably making a thicker layer might be more protective. Uh, so we've investigated the effect of changing the TiO2 thickness on the performance. Uh, and we, this is easy to do with ALD because we have the cyclic deposition. We just do a uh, different number of cycles and we grow a thicker or thinner film. So if we uh, control the thickness of the TiO2, we can see that the effective turn-on potential um, varies in a, in a systematic way with the TiO2 thickness. We can extract from that an effective overpotential for water oxidation, and we see that it has this really interesting linear characteristic. So the TiO2 is basically behaving like a linear resistor uh, when it's above a thickness of about 2 nanometers. So these thinner thicknesses, they deviate from the linear relationship. But thicker than 2 nanometers, we have effectively a linear resistance. And that linear resistance it corresponds to about 20 uh, uh, millivolts per additional nanometer of TiO2. It's a modest overpotential penalty that we have with this TiO2. Uh, the fact that it deviates at thinner thicknesses tells us, as do other data, that there's a different conduction mechanism limiting the performance of the device for very thin uh, uh, thicknesses, and this is tunneling of, of, of holes across the SiO2, but between the uh, uh, TiO2 and the, and the silicon. So uh, we can uh, then break down the problem of lowering the resistance of this structure to two parts. We need to make the, th the SiO2 thinner. When we do that, uh, we should see uh, higher uh, currents. And we should um, also uh, look at making the TiO2 more conductive. So in the first part, we've looked at a variety of different techniques. I'm not going to go into these in any detail, but they all involve thinning the SiO2 and then either putting the TiO2 on top or putting the TiO2 on top first and then thinning the T SiO2 afterward. And they all work. Uh, some are work better than others. But it, generally, they'll reduce the overpotential by as much as 50 uh, to 100 millivolts, which is a big uh, uh, advantage for thinning the, t the SiO2. So we're going to be reporting that on, on that in the publication soon. Another approach then is going to be making the, the TiO2 more conductive. And here we found that annealing of the TiO2 is very important. And uh, in particular, annealing in this hydrogen containing uh, atmosphere called forming gas, uh, we find uh, can have a really substantial effect on the behavior of these, these uh, protected anodes. So 
Focusing on the water splitting data here, we can see that uh, by annealing and, and ch changing the annealing temperature, uh, the systematics of this relationship between temperature and, and turn on potential are yet to be uh, fully uh, elucidated. But clearly, a hydrogen anneal, even at very low temperatures, has a big effect. We, we turn these things on uh, much um, uh, more abruptly uh, for these relatively thick uh, coatings that we're showing here, 14 nanometers. And uh, we can see the same thing in these uh, cyclic voltammograms from a standard redox couple, ferrocyanide, that's uh, soluble in aqueous solution. So as this hysteretic feature gets tighter, that's an indication that holes uh, can be transported across the interface between the semiconductor and the electrolyte more easily. Uh, so we see that happening as soon as we do these forming gas anneals. Another interesting thing is that the centroid of this feature shifts to these negative potentials, and that's an indication of an increase in photovoltage. So we're actually not only making it more conductive, we're making the drive, effective driving force that we have to work with larger. So that's an interesting phenomena in itself. So uh, we've, we've studied recently what it takes to maximize this photovoltage when we have silicon connected to a catalyst with these intervening um, oxide layers. And uh, it's a very interesting story. So we, we start with uh, uh, just our reference data, which is in the dark, electrolysis with P plus silicon. So we have uh, all, all kinds of holes available for water oxidation. And we see this nice linear resistance behavior I discussed a couple of slides back. Uh, if we do that same experiment now, shining the light with n-type silicon, uh, we see a very different behavior, a much more dramatic effect of the TiO2 thickness. And the way that we infer our photovoltage is by looking at the difference between these two, these two uh, sets of curves. So if we, if we think about that, we start off for very thin films with about a 500 millivolt photovoltage, similar to what we were showing uh, previously. And then uh, if we go to the thickest films, now the effective photovoltage is negative. So we have, we're, we're effectively consuming driving force in order to uh, make the uh, carrier transport in the structure work and not to use that to actually drive the electrochemistry. So uh, that process, that negative photovoltage, seems to result from the fact that we have the photogeneration of the holes occurring right at the interface where we're trying to extract the holes into the oxide to get to the catalyst. If we make that photogeneration remote from the interface by putting in a PN junction, a P plus N junction on the surface of the silicon, so we separate those two phenomena, uh, we have um, this relationship here. It looks just like the P plus silicon, but it shifted uh, down, which corresponds to a large photovoltage. So now we've been able to achieve record photovoltages for, for silicon photoelectrodes of about 630 millivolts by just do, using this, this PN junction on the surface. And we've seen this not only for TiO2 thickness, but also for SiO2, other oxides we put on. They all have this kind of relationship associated with where the photogeneration happens versus the the extraction of, of holes. So, say just a couple of things about catalyst choice. So we heard a, a nice presentation on this just before mine. Um, we've uh, focused on these very rare uh, and, and crazy expensive catalysts because they are um, they're really great. As I was mentioning, they have many of the physical properties that we're looking for for this kind of structure. Um, uh, unfortunately, iridium is the rarest of the rare here. This is the elemental abundance in the Earth's crust. Iridium is right there. So um, uh, that's probably not great. Um, we, we want to also look at other uh, options. Uh, sticking with, um, with catalysts that have this high work function uh, and that have very uh, low overpotentials, we've been focusing on ruthenium, which is about three orders of magnitude more earth abundant than iridium, similar to platinum, which is a widely used industrial catalyst. Uh, we've been looking at ruthenium ALD. We want to make these layers really, really thin uh, to minimize the use of this noble metal. And we've seen that actually RuO2 is not stable under water oxidation conditions, even in, um, in base. Although it's a good catalyst, it will be slowly dissolved away. In fact, even not so slowly dissolved away. So these are some uh, uh, water splitting data, current uh, potential uh, voltage data, where we see just a collapse of the current as we sweep several times because the ruthenium is dissolving away into the solution. Uh, we found a way to, to, um, to address that is to make uh, an alloy. So we do ALD of TiO2 and ruthenium oxide using what we call super cycles. So effectively, we, we mix the cycles of one precursor with cycles of another and build up an alloy of some uh, controlled composition. Uh, and in this case, the films are about 10 nanometers in thickness uh, with one TiO2 cycle for every four ruthenium oxide cycles. 
uh, but it's actually mainly TiO2, the film, in terms of its composition. Uh, we can combine then the protective functionality of the TiO2 with the catalytic functionality of the ruthenium oxide, and we see when we do these multiple sweeps that there's basically no change in the, uh, in the, in the current potential characteristics, so uh, across the full range of pH. So it looks like it's possible with an alloying strategy to greatly enhance stability. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're still working on this to try to optimize it further. Last two slides, three slides, I just wanted to say something about how do you put all these things together to make a really efficient uh, solar to hydrogen conver uh, conversion device. And basically what we need to do is match the properties of the solar components with those of the electrochemical components. Now, if this is done separately, we still have to do the same thing. Here we're doing this in an integrated device in this particular project. So uh, what we want to do is combine these things in such a way that the operating current, where these two curves combine, this is the load curve for the catalysts and the electrochemical part and the IV curve for the solar part, where they cross at a high current density and at a voltage that's sufficiently high that we can actually drive the water splitting process at, at, at the, that rate, at that, at that rate of, of 10 milliamps per centimeter squared. So the STH efficiency can be calculated by knowing what that current is and the incident insulation and the, the theoretical uh, potential that we need to split water. And the target that the DOE has for this is about 15%. That's actually quite an aggressive target. Um, so currently we have 630 millivolts with protected crystalline silicon, and we believe there's a path to enhance that further, perhaps to as high as 700 millivolts. That means we need another 900 millivolts to be able to do this best case. Uh, so we're looking at tandem uh, devices like this, where we, instead of having an electrode, a photoelectrode and a, and a, and a metal uh, counter-electrode, we have uh, two photoelectrodes with different band gaps that can absorb light in a serial fashion and, and harvest it very efficiently. Uh, each one would then be decorated with the appropriate catalyst for oxygen evolution or hydrogen evolution, and presumably each would need its own kind of protection layer because it's likely that these materials are not going to be stable in an aqueous environment for a long, long term. So we're looking at ALD as a solution to this kind of uh, integrated tandem uh, kind of device. Some initial results, we've been uh, looking at amorphous silicon as one of the choices for a larger band gap photoelectrode material. It has a band gap of uh, about 1.8 electron volts, which matches the 1.1 electron volts of silicon very well from a photovoltaic standpoint. Um, and uh, it will deliver, in this case, uh, uh, the, this is the IV curve for, a, for a, in a photo, uh, photovoltaic measurement for an amorphous silicon film. It'll deliver 800 to 900 um, millivolts of, of open circuit voltage, which is a, we can use that as a measure of the photovoltage we'd get in a photoelectric chemical uh, cell. Uh, we see that the TiO2, when we deposit TiO2 on these structures, it doesn't uh, ruin the behavior of the amorphous silicon. It, it has the same kind of IV characteristics, and we see the same thing in cyclic voltammetry in our ferro, uh, ferriferocyanide solution. So it looks like the TiO2 is not damaging the amorphous silicon, that's not, and that's to be expected, because chemically the amorphous silicon is very similar to crystalline. So we're trying to put these things together now in a functioning tandem. So in conclusion, um, we've... Uh, looked at hydrogen generated from sunlight to help accommodate uh, intermittency of solar power and as a key component uh, of renewable chemical synthesis. Uh, we think water is a convenient source of the electrons and protons that we need for solar fuel synthesis at a, at a large scale. And water oxidation, of course, is kinetically difficult, so we need catalysts, and we need to be able to combine the catalysts and, and, the, and the light absorbers in an efficient way. Uh, I think you can read the other uh, bullets here, and I thank you for your attention. Back there. Hi, great talk. Thank so you. Uh, you show these very nice photo anodes where you employ an MIS structure, and they're both very active and very stable for the oxygen evolution reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about uh, decreasing the catalyst loading, loading of iridium. Yeah. So do you think you could use iridium nanoparticles, or yeah. do you really need that high density of states to, right, to right. tunnel through the oxide? That's a great question. So. Um, I'll break it down into two parts. We, we have actually looked at thinning the iridium further. The iridium that I've showed here is actually deposited by just evaporation, so it's not ALD. Uh, we think we can push it further down to sort of a couple of monolayers level with a well-designed ALD process, so sort of sub-nanometer. At that point, the cost of the iridium starts to become pretty small, although who knows what's going to happen when you try to scale this up to a massive you know, industrial 
proportion when iridium is basically present on the Earth as a result of meteor impacts. So uh, it's not extremely available. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the issue about um, uniform coating versus islands is a really interesting one. Uh, and I'm not going to get into all the details, but um, uh, because the, you're, you're limited by the kinetics of that oxidation reaction, you'd like as many sites as possible on the anode surface for the water oxidation to, to take place on. So um, I think you want to lay this down flat if you can and uh, just keep it very, very thin. And just a related question to that. So if you, if you look at the, inter, you showed the interface, I guess, as deposited. If you look at it after um, performance in a cell, does, is the catalyst layer still a, a dense, thick layer, or, or does it, do you see any porosity develop? Yeah, so, so one of the questions we have is uh, on, on occasions where these things do fail, you know, why do they fail? And uh, we have on occasion seen evidence of catalyst loss um, and, um, you know, if you think about the oxidation of the iridium, there's a huge volume expansion that occurs when that happens. And, um, and it's quite possible that the TiO2, it's one of its main roles is, is, is an effective sticking layer to keep the catalyst stuck down to the silicon as it's undergoing this tremendous um, compression from, from, from the, uh, the volume expansion that's being compressed by the substrate underneath it. And, and it could be local kind of... Uh, cracking events that are responsible for catalyst loss in some of the experiments. So we're trying to, to deduce that now, but um, the nice thing about ALD is we can depo directly deposit the oxide of these catalysts as well, and that would avoid that failure mechanism. One more question up here. So um, uh, maybe an economic question here. So you have a, uh, a um, photochemical process an issue with photochemical processes is getting the light in and out. Yeah. In this in this case. Right. So, is the, has anybody you or anybody done a comparison between this kind of technology where you're not only making a planar electrochemical surface, but then the whole chemistry of right. getting uh, the chemicals in and out. Yeah. Versus, for example, PV. Sure. Which is PV plus very, plus very an electrolyzer cost and producing the hydrogen by classical yeah. electrolysis? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It, it's, it is a subject of great interest in the community. There have been a number of techno-econometric econometric analyses. Um, I think that the assumptions there are quite, um, you know, biggest, they're big assumptions because we're, we're still at a research phase. It's hard to, uh, to properly estimate all of the factors that you need to, to do that analysis correctly. And of course, they never, those analyses never do a good job of, of dealing with, um, you know, um, disruptive changes in uh, technology or, or uh, economics that can, that can be important. So uh, at this point, I think the jury is out. One, one of the arguments in, fa in favor of the integrated approach is that the balance of systems costs are, are less. You're using the same area to both do the chemistry and do the light absorption. Uh, but uh, there's also the, the advantages of having a separate system. Maybe if the sun isn't shining, you can hook up your electrolyzer to some other source uh, and generate hydrogen at night. So from a flexibility standpoint, a, a separated system also is, is interesting. So I don't think it's clear yet. Yeah, I think, I mean, the estimates that I've seen, I think it, PV plus electrolysis is $6 a kilogram hydrogen, I think is the estimate from the analyses that have been done recently. But most of the analyses, as Paul mentioned, have been focused on different configurations of the photoelectrochemical cell. And you can find numbers from $10 a kilogram to $2 a kilogram. Depending on how you um, but do the, it. But you know, the lower the number, the more speculation, because the, right. the technology is still in the research. Yeah, basically. it's just not clear at this point. Yeah, Sally. So, what about water so we have to run yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, the nice thing is that this is a closed process. So when you do that, you know, you, you do that once, and then unless there's some, some strange leakage going on, you don't have to keep doing it. I think purity is really important. Um, we, we, another w a kind of failure that we've observed has been uh, under conditions where we think we're getting some, uh, we do these tests inside a Teflon cone. And if we have a new Teflon cone, 
Um, sometimes we see schmutz being deposited on the surface as we do these long-term tests. So there's some, something um, from the machining of that Teflon that's being released uh, into the water. Uh, so um, that there's clearly, uh, cleanliness is clearly an issue. Um, so yeah, I think that you'd have to purify the water to some pretty high standard initially. Okay, so in the interest of time, uh, yeah. please join me in thanking Paul. Right. Thank you.